Hey everybody, I'm feeling a bit under the weather as I edit this episode of the podcast, but I do need to make an insert here at the very beginning to let you know that we are voting already on the next title to be covered on the podcast. If you would like to be a part of that voting, please take a look at our Patreon page for patrons at $5 or above. The perks that you get at that level are the ability to vote on games that we cover, as well as other polls that we do for the channel. And also, you get to submit questions that we answer on the exclusive podcast, which is only made for patrons and subscribe star subscribers as well. In any case, this month we are voting on three Final Fantasy titles, Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy Tactics, and Final Fantasy X. At the moment, Final Fantasy Tactics is in the lead. So, this poll will be running for a few more days, just up through the end of this week. On Sunday night at 11.59pm, the the poll will end, and then we'll know which game we'll be covering next on the podcast. So, just wanted to let you know, if you want to be a part of that vote, the voting is going on right now. Thanks everybody, hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kaysen. Uh We're going to continue on from leaving the Citadel, which is where we left off last time, to the Liara's dig site mission and Novaria. Yeah. Um, I also did, in one of my playthroughs, a side quest called Asteroid X-57. I had never... No, I did it... Too, I had never played this before. This is my I've played the game many times and I had never played this before. I did a lot of the small the little missions. Little and stuff. missions around. Yeah. I, I kind of had a kick out of that at, at first. If that sounds so familiar though. Tell me what um happened there. Okay, hold on. Because uh, I think I did something like that too. The 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 premise of it is there's an asteroid with like you know, minerals and, and resources on it. And there's yeah. um so uh, Eden Prime was like humanity's like first like really successful colony, mm-hmm. but there was another planet called Terra Nova in the same cluster. Okay. Um, so they would have used the same mass relay to arrive in that area of okay, space. Okay, yeah. So there's another really successful colony called Terra Nova. The X-57 asteroid was being brought into the orbit of Terra Nova so that they could mine it and resource it. Yeah, in, okay, yeah. In its, during its flight path, it was sort of like, um, what do you call it? Captured? Uh, when like a guy, hi- hijacked. Oh, hijacked, yes. It was like hijacked by some Batarians and they are actually taking it there. They're gonna try to ram it into the Terra Nova planet and like basically wipe out everybody on the planet. Okay, right. It would be like worse than the dinosaur extinction. Yes. On on Earth, right? So it's like they so put did, these I giant they put these giant like rockets on it and and that's and what's just like propelling it towards Yeah, the planet. shooting it towards. So yeah. So um, the Batarians are fascinating about it. They're they're like the outskirts outskirt faring people. Batarians are, right, I, think, I, I think, I didn't see them at the Citadel. There are a lot of Batarians who are involved in criminal organizations in mm. the Terminus systems, but I don't know if Batarians as a whole species are like not involved at all, like if they oh, have okay. no ambassadors. Sure. Okay, so I just fact checked myself on this. And yes, Batarians are not involved in any way with uh, the Citadel. Um, they, they basically are, they isolated themselves on purpose. It says here, a race of four-eyed bipeds native to the world of Karshan, the Batarians are a disreputable species that chose to isolate itself from the rest of the galaxy. The Terminus systems are infested with Batarian pirate gangs and slaving rings, fueling the stereotype of the Batarian thug. So, there you go. Yeah, they have no presence on the Citadel. Obviously would have no ambassadors or anything like that because they chose to stay out of it. Okay, this actually brings up some of the notes that I didn't go over in mm-hmm. the um, the dev history stuff. Batarians were like the original Geth. Oh, really? That Saren was gonna be leading a race of these bat-like uh, aliens, right? The four eyes. Um, that, are, they, that are original, or eventually became Geth instead of them. But the Batarians were the first like evil 
like bad guys you would be mm. fighting all the time instead of Geth. Oh, really? Um, so they, they still, in the current version of the story, are mostly the ones involved in the gangs and the criminal organizations. But I don't remember if Batarians have like no presence on the Citadel or not. I didn't see any, like you said, while I was exploring yeah, the Citadel. I, I like literally can't remember even one because yeah. they have four eyes, right? Yes, yes. But anyways, um, this X-57 uh, asteroid mission, I believe, is a DLC. And I had never played this before nice. in any playthrough of Mass Effect before oh, this. And I kind of accidentally got involved in it. I was like, this is actually a pretty cool little story. Huh. And it led me to a another point of one of the things I love about Western style RPGs. Mm -hmm. They're almost like episodic in a way. Sure. In terms of yes. how their side quests work, where yeah. they tell these really great little episodic stories that are like yeah. really self-contained. And you can almost just get lost in doing those. And sometimes those are even better than like the main quest. They're pretty cool. I started wondering like, am I preemptively doing other quests, <laughs> like mainline quests yeah. out of order? Because yeah. cause they seem like pretty good stories. Yeah. Like there's actually interesting stuff going on here. Yeah, and like the Witcher games feel mm. that way. But yeah. even the Witcher novels are like that. Because oh, the, the, yeah. the first two are, um, they're, they're not like part of a, a continuing saga story. It's, it, they're, they're, they're just, like these episodic yeah. little short stories of yeah. Geralt's life. And those are the parts of the Witcher stories I enjoy more. And those are cool, yeah. Than yeah. like the main quests. The big long so to story, speak, right? Yeah. So anyways, I really enjoyed that. I don't know if we'll dig into it too much, but I thought it was a really well done little DLC. Well, it ends with expansion. that ethical conundrum at the very end, which is something along the lines of, do you do who do you who do you kill or who do you allow to be killed? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And in order to save these people, you have to let something else happen. I don't know how many people would have played this uh, that are watching, but it, a lot of these end up in some type of ethical conundrum where the paragon option isn't so obvious. Yeah. Right. Uh, there is clearly a right-ish, a more right thing to do, I think. Yeah. Um, but it's not like you're good if you do it or you're bad if you do the other one. You know. Right. Um, so, anyways. I did that, um, and, and well, let's just talk about the galaxy map, because that's kind of right where we left off last time. Yeah. This is where the first time I played the game, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm all in now. <laughs> like, I already really liked a lot of things, yeah. like the Citadel and the different races and the, the Codex and the, like, all this like world building they were doing. Yeah. There's a lot of really fascinating stuff, and I was really into it. But then I got to the galaxy map, and I explained this so I won't you know, reiterate or repeat myself too much but it just transported me back into a time as a kid when I really loved astronomy. Yeah. And there was something about the combination of the music and the visuals and the going to different planets and surveying and learning, like reading all of the, um, you know, all the things about the, this is a gas giant and this is its, um, its orbit and this, oh, is, yes, yeah. this is the type of, uh, you know, minerals that you'll find on this planet. Yeah. I, I just would pour over that. Yeah. And I was just like, dude, there's like a whole passion for something I almost forgot I had. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> like it was just like, oh, I need, I want to get back into astronomy again. You know, there was just something about the way the galaxy map was presented and the exploration of Mass Effect that now came into effect yeah. at this point in the game. You can kind of go anywhere, right? Yeah. Um, it, it sort of points you towards this system has your next mission in it. Right. But there's a whole bunch of systems you I can know. go to. Yeah, so it's like you go to this like section and then there's this system and then it zooms in at once again, right? Yeah. So you're like, I'll go here and then there's this thing to do here and then bloop, and then you, it's, it's just, it's really cool. It's really yeah. cool. And a lot of people, there was a, a lot of complaints about the Mako, the little um, tank Oh, yeah. That you drive around It can in. go up like a cliff. Like that <laughs> well, thing is just so versatile. A lot of people found it very boring, gameplay-wise, to drive across these barren planet landscapes and like go to these little points of interest and, oh, here's a little mineral over here or here's like an enemy base over here. There's okay. a lot of repeated assets. Now, I, I have um, heard that it gets repetitive. Yes. At the moment, for me, it's not repetitive. Right. It's sweet. But I could see at some point being like, oh, this is just a procedurally generated thing. Yes. And and there's, there's no doubt. Uh, 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 most of the things that people will bring up as mm. complaints or criticisms of Mass Effect, it's not a game that where I'm like going to die on a hill like defending all this. Every, every little thing. Because 
I, I get it. Like, right. I really do get why people don't love Mass Effect. Right. And it's like, I can see why people would find that to be boring. I love it. Yeah, me too. I just love it's pretty exploring cool. all those little planets and driving around in the car. And because there's something about the idea of traveling to different worlds and like the science, the science part of it, the scientific yeah. research part of it, not just it's the cool. fighting part. Because before you go to any of the, well, some of them I don't think you can even go to, but um, you, there's like a little survey option. Yeah, you can like survey. You, and you, it'll give Ooh. you some list of what potential yeah. you Yeah, and there's like there. collectibles. Yeah, it's sweet. Whether it's the Asari Matrix writings or certain uh, geological findings mm -hmm. or whatever it might be that there's a certain number of them you can collect. And to get like a, there's like a, complete, a completionist aspect oh, to that. Oh, of course. Like yeah, a yeah. collecting aspect that to that, right? right? So like, I, I loved it. I think, I, I loved the exploration of it. And um, there are a lot of people who find the level design of Mass Effect bland. Again, totally reasonable. Mm. A lot of the assets are reused. A lot of the buildings, you're going through the same buildings over and over again. That, fighting yes. the same enemies over and over again. Driving over similar like landscapes, yeah. collecting similar things over and over again. I get it. I get it. Uh, I do not blame you for not liking that if you don't like it. I loved it. Yeah. It created in me, or it, it reminded me, not created, reminded me of my passion for astronomy. Yeah. My, my, I just always believing I was born in the wrong era. Yeah. Wishing I had been born in the time of the Star, uh, Starship Enterprise instead oh, of yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just being like, that's what I really wanted in life was to go out into space and to colonize planets and to, <laughs> you know, travel around and see what's out there. And um, obviously it's never gonna happen in my lifetime outside of maybe like Mars being colonized. Oh, con may maybe yeah, one like the moon or something. Yeah, yeah there, there's some interesting ideas for how they could uh, do something similar on Venus with like a floating, um, uh, up in the upper atmosphere, they could create like a- Oh like yeah, a, like, like a, a, like a, a cloud, cloud city. Cloud city, yeah, Lando's place, yeah. Yep. yeah. Or, or sort of on these uh, balloons and airships that they could use to survey it. There's so many like cool possibilities, but these things will happen when I'm, an old man probably, right? Very far And in the future, will probably yeah. never leave the solar system in my lifetime. I no. find that very sad. <laughs> Not unless we discover some Prothean. <laughs> so I got obelisk. really I got really hooked and really obsessed with just literally going to every possible planet I could go to. Yeah. Just seeing what's there. Um, Which you don't have to do, by the no. way. To to uh, the people who find this to be a very Boring. obnoxious task. It's yeah. like, well, it's also a very optional task. It's like, yeah, most of space. There's not really much out there. <laughs> it's just a fact. It's, it's, it's just a lot of like dead planets and stars and yes, yes, and a lot of not a lot of life, a lot of nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And that could be very boring for most people. Yeah. I think a lot of that stuff's fascinating to me. Yeah. And so, anyways, my new obsession is actually what I use to make these backgrounds here. It's a it's a little it's not really a game, but you can get it on Steam. It's called um, Space Engine, and it's like a way better version mm -hmm. of what I was enjoying about Mass Effect in oh, going to yeah. planets. Where you can literally every, go anywhere. Every single star you are seeing in this little two and a half hour video no. uh, passage through the Milky Way galaxy here is explorable. They'll have planets around them. You can land on those planets. You can, sweet. You can go out to other galaxies. Hmm. To basically anywhere in the known universe. The obs not known, but the observable, observable. universe. Yeah, sure. And um, obviously a lot of this will be procedurally generated because we don't know. We don't have names right. for every one of these stars. Or we don't know if they yes. have, they all have planets or whatever. Right, right. But the ones we do know, you can type in and go to them. And it'll just, your ship will go there. You can customize your little ship. You can change your speed. And one of the things that really blew my mind about this, I know this is a tangent off of mm. Mass Effect, but it just, it, it really, I think what I find fascinating about space and astronomy is that the scale consistently surprises me. Yes, and it, it makes me dizzy. Uh, if I just look up yes. at night, I like get vertigo because yes. I'm like, that star is a trillion times bigger than Earth. <laughs> like just thinking about that, I'm like, yeah. I just kind of have to stop looking at it for a little bit. That exercise, it's that part of it. Imagine yeah. trying to wrap my head around the scope of yeah, space crazy. that is just an unending, will never stop being fascinating mental mm -hmm. exercise for me. And so in this game, right, you're seeing these stars fly by, like, and it, it, it's, there's, you almost look at it and it's like, oh, those two look really close together mm -hmm. at this speed, which is about <laughs> 10.75 light years per second. 
Oh, wow. It's the speed at which this is currently running here. Not bad, not bad. Which is by the end of the two and a half hours, you've gone all the way across the Milky Way the galaxy. Whole, yeah. And you're basically leaving on the other side of it. So at this speed, it, they look close. It makes the scale of space look yeah. small. Yep. And, and then at any point I could stop and switch to say the speed of like the Voyager 2. Mm. which is going, I think, something like 6,500 kilometers an hour, or is it 65,000 kilometers an hour? I can't remember. Yeah. It's something really insane, right. really fast. But if I stop this and I start going at that speed, It'll start none of these stars slow. will move. Yeah, yeah. None of them will move. It will look like a picture, just a still image. Yeah. And I, you'll never reach any of these stars <laughs> in your lifetime. You'll never reach them because mm. it, it'll take freaking thousands and thousands of years to get to from wherever we are currently if i stop this to whatever the closest star is to me when we stopped that's wild hundreds of thousands of years and there's nothing in between that space nothing there's nothing there it's unbelievable and then yeah. i go back to nearly 11 light years per second mm -hmm. and it's like oh the scale seems small again but it's like no it's not that is those two things that look zooming past me that look like they're that mm -hmm. close together are unfathomably far apart. Right. Anyways, Mass Effect's galaxy map at yeah. the time I played it in 2008 or whatever s ignited that kind of mental exercise of trying to wrap my head around space and this is yeah. so cool and all of that kind of thing. It ignited that passion in me. So, do you remember back in back when you first played the game where where is the first place that you went when you were able to go anywhere oh, in the dude, galaxy? Great question. I think I went to the Sol System, which is where Earth is. Yes, me too. I went there. I first. wonder how many people. I knew. <laughs> I knew that. I wonder how many people would have done the same thing. When you can go anywhere, the first thing that I feel like a lot of people will have done yeah. is, where's Earth? Yeah. Where's Earth? You want to get back here. In relation to you everything. Come, yes. Yeah. And so you go there, you find it, you, and I, I went and I, I, I drove on the moon. Right. Yes. Yeah. Land on the moon and right I was away. Like, sick. Sick. And then you can see Earth. It's out <laughs> yeah. there. It's yeah. so cool. That's the first thing that I did was yeah. I found Earth and then I went there. And then from there, I then, you know, Started went from everywhere else. It felt, it felt better to do that. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I, I also just wondered if they included Earth at all. Mm -hmm. And they did. So it was like, sweet. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Mm. It's really great. And I just enjoy the music and just like browsing around and just like looking at stuff. Yep. That part to me is just a lot of fun. Just surveying everything. I spend a lot of time just doing that and not even like, you know, playing the game really. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, the first mission that I would recommend doing um, because you recruit your last character there is to go to Liara's dig site first. Um, it's a mm -hmm. little bit harder than the two other missions, um, but it depends on the difficulty you're playing on, I guess. I'm, I think I'm playing on normal difficulty and none of it's really that hard. Right. Uh, and it also depends on how much time you spent talking to people and gaining experience and leveling up on the Citadel. Because right. if you do all those side quests and talk to all those people, you can level up quite significantly on the Citadel. Yeah, and don't don't forget to allocate them to your characters. Yeah, <laughs> if you bring them with you, go into your squad menu, yes, and make sure level do, 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 them do, do, do. up, <laughs> right? Um, so let's talk about Liara's dig site a little bit. It's a pretty short mission. It's basically yeah. just you get in there, get her and get her out. Yeah, you it's see her like, and she's like, ah, oh, go, what is it, the, the Geth attacked her little yeah. dig site, but she she did a, a defensive thing, but she got ended up getting stuck in it, right? Yeah. So she's like, it's she's, a shield, but she's like suspended. She's a scientist and she's an archeologist mm -hmm. who specializes in the Protheans. So she's researching yeah, yeah. the Protheans. So this is oh, all Protheans. and we didn't technology. mention this, her mother, is Matriarch Beneza. Is Matriarch Beneza, which this is, this is, which is weird. Why, this is why one of the, it's one of the leads for us, right? Because yes. I think it's Ambassador Udina, when we're leaving the Citadel, Yeah, says, he gives us three Here's, leads. Yeah, three yeah. places you can go to start mm. your investigation. Uh, Matriarch Beneza has a daughter named Liara, and she's doing her science and archaeology over here in this system. Yeah. That might be a good <clears> place to start. Or you could go to Navaria or Pharaohs. And so, for me, it's best to go to Liara's dig site first because if you have her on your team and you bring her with you to Novaria, that's where you confront the matriarch. Yeah. Um, and so it's good to have her in the team, I feel, for that mission. Um, so anyways, 
Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. She could have not not been in your she party could have at not all been there. when you go to, to to confront Matriarch Benezia. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Again, I there's mean, so I many get, ways you can approach I get the, game. the party thing, but she could have not even been an option. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. See, this is the danger of giving people a free <laughs> Too choice. Too many choices. <laughs> in a game where it's like, yeah, you could end up missing some really deep stuff, you know? Yeah, but while we're on the topic of allocating um, points to your characters and mm -hmm. some of the gameplay stuff, maybe let's touch on that for a minute. Because, um, you, you know, this, this podcast is mostly about talking about the stories. The story, the characters. But I do yeah. like to at least touch on gameplay a little bit. Yeah. I think this is another thing that a lot of people... Not, not a lot of people. There are some people who have voiced criticism of this game in the mm. comments of our first episode. Uh, I, I can't understand why people love this game so much. The gameplay is so boring or it's so bland okay. or it's so bad or whatever. Right. Um, you're playing the original yeah, version? Yeah, it's original, but it's... Not a, the legendary Yeah, remaster. I'm not playing the one that came out recently. Yeah. Okay. And we've talked a little bit about some of the drift on the guns. And yes. Some things that they've changed for the new version that make it a smoother experience. Mm. Um, but this is also something to keep in mind that in Mass Effect 2 and 3, it becomes less of an RPG and more of a third-person shooter. Okay. And the shooting mechanics... It kind mechanics, of felt like they should have just gone all in that way yeah. anyways, playing the first one. It's like, just go all the way. Don't, don't try to sort of keep the RPG Knights of the Old Republic type thing that they were doing. Yeah. The shooting gets way better in yeah. the sequels. And I think that's why a lot of people who, like, could not get into Mass Effect One, mm -hmm. but, but maybe like Mass Effect Two or something. Yeah, it's, it's I've heard largely two is like the best one. It's largely because level design, shooting mechanics, okay. the, the minute to minute gameplay it's just an easier is or, much smoother. Smoother, that's a good. And point. just like more fun to move around okay, and yeah. w interact with the world. All of that is true. Yeah, I still love Mass Effect One for reasons other than that, <laughs> but. Um, I think the Legendary Edition does improve massively some of those little quirks okay, about the gameplay of the original that a lot of people couldn't get past. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do miss the RPG mechanics that they did away with more and more as the series went on. So that leveling up thing, does that happen you still? still? Have, you still have a similar leveling up system. Is there it's as just, many? Because there's a it's ton just of not, options. There's just not as much of it. Which is probably better. Yeah, I guess they just strip it down. Okay, um, so but the, you yeah. still have your biotic or or uh, what do they call it? Your engineer like type abilities and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I was chatting about with some people on the Discord server in our podcast chat. Um, they were talking about how oh the mechanics of the game gets so much better in the sequels. It's mm -hmm. like that's true, and I remember because it was before I had really gotten into these playthroughs I'm doing now. Um, but I, I remember that in most of my previous playthroughs, I would try, I'm gonna try this class out. I'm gonna try their abilities out. Right. But I always just ended up shooting everything and not <laughs> using the abilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, the, do you, have you used any of like the long, the distance, like sniper rifle yes. and stuff yet? That's what I'm not because the, so good at. The, yeah. the drift, it does, yeah. there's no drift. And it's like, I in just, the legendary I version. basically ignore, really. There's no okay. drift at all. So make that a lot easier. Yeah, but the thing is, is that if you level up, your skill in snipers, right. that drift goes down. Yeah, but I'd rather just, you know, <laughs> use the other <laughs> weapons. Right. So there's Which there's is fine. It's an option and, thing. There's and pros it's like, and cons. Yeah, yeah. But it's much better or much smoother as a third-person shooter in the Legendary Edition than in the original game, but it's missing some of the RPG mechanics. Anyways, mm. um, this time around, I have been doing a lot more of the abilities. So the, on, the, on the right bumper, it pulls up a separate wheel and you have your yeah. comrades and their abilities that you're leveling up in yours. Um, my goodness, some of those engineer abilities uh, are really effective against the Geth. Oh, really? Like overload mm. and um, there's another one. Anyways, it's basically like a, it like overloads the systems of the Geth. So any like inorganic, like robot type enemy you're fighting, yeah. you use these abilities and, and Garrus has some similar ones so you can like have him use them and you use them in tandem. You're just like, just wrecking these Geth with like abilities. Uh, and then against certain organics, you know, the biotic abilities are really good. Yeah. So warp and uh, things like that, or, or I think there's one where you can, uh, stasis I think it is, you like mm. freeze them for a second. Oh, uh, and so I've been getting more into using the abilities and it makes the game it makes the gameplay experience way better. Yeah. But there was something about it. I don't know if it's like they didn't tutorialize it well enough 
in the Eden Prime mission or something, mm. but it was just there was some barrier to it. It was like I'll just shoot them, right? And I, I mean, just I just shot things. What I just and the <laughs> shooting mechanics were not the strength of the gameplay in the original mm. game. So it was like I could I see, see why a lot of there. people might have been turned off by that, right? Oh huh, yeah. But I feel like they've done a good job in the legendary legendary edition of smoothing it over. And as I've experimented more with the abilities, it's like this is actually pretty sweet. I yeah. actually really like it. Hmm. So. It's kind of like the biotic abilities are like the magic of the game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the black magic or whatever. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but anyways, um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I know you were saying last time it wasn't your cup of tea. I, I'm, wise, I'm getting better at it. I mean, there are certain things like I just, I'm not as, as big into the action shooter games just yeah. in general, you know? Yeah. Um, and this game just leans a little too heavy in that direction. And. That's the, I just want to play RPGs. That's what I want to do. <laughs> I just just give me the story. I don't want to have to keep like shooting stuff, finessing and aiming. But but you know it is something that I can get used to. I'm 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 better at it, so it's not a big deal anymore. Okay. I, I mostly remember it being a huge issue when I first played the game for the first time. Yeah. Back in 2008 or something. Yeah. And it's not so much an issue now. I still don't love it though. I still would rather not. You know. Yeah. Have to worry about it. There's also the Mako itself, which has a couple guns. On it, it's got like a yeah, it's like got a machine like a gun and then like yeah. a cannon, and so like as you're driving around, you shooting at turrets or large yeah, geth enemies or whatever. It's got shields in it. You can, can run of, into stuff too. Just yeah, like, just like run them over. Yeah, um, it's got like a like a turbo sort of boost forward, but also mm. one that kind of lifts you off the ground. So when they're shooting missiles at you, you can chill, like jump over them <laughs> and like yeah, keep fighting. I, I find it fun. <laughs> I, I liked it. I really liked uh, yeah. driving that thing around. I, I really like the Mako, and unfortunately, they kind of do away with it in the second game. Really, they don't let you like land on planets and explore them and that thing like they did. What? And how it's because how... it was so complained about, it was oh. so criticized, and mm. it, it was less. It wasn't as good in the original version of the game. It's a little clunky to control the thing. It wasn't like super tight. Yeah. So I get it, but like in this legendary edition, driving that thing feels really buttery mm. smooth. And it's like, oh, it's too bad that this will not return in Mass Effect 2, right? <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, too much. Um, but anyways, those are kind of my thoughts on uh, the gameplay of Mass Effect. But um, Okay, so you go to the planet. I think it's called Therum, which is where Liara's Prothean Liara's Big Sight is okay, at. Yeah. You kind of land outside, and you do a lot of that. You're driving in to where she's at, and you're fighting a lot of Geth along yeah. the way. And there's different like outposts. There's different buildings. Yeah. And there's like Geth ships that'll like come in and do drops and like yes. drop dudes down. Yes. That was kind of a cool moment. I was driving. I just hear like these you like look jet up, engines. It's this like, big Whoa. ship too. <laughs> yeah, just flies yeah. in and just drops some Geth down and just like takes off. That was something else. That happens a couple times. You fight your way in there, you get to the dig site itself, and on the outside there's like a big battle where they where you're not in the, the Mako anymore, but they drop one of the big dudes, one of the big geth down. Yeah. And so there's there's these little like crawly guys. I don't know the technical name, but they like zoom around and they're really hard to get a beat on and they're mm -hmm. like sniping you. And there's like a, another Geth sniper over there and there's some other, t and then there's this big tank dude coming at you. It's, a, it's one of the tougher fights in the game, but kind of fun to, you know, like try different ways of doing that, particularly with using your squad mates, commanding yeah. them, you know, you bunk here, you go here, you use this and you use this, put your shields up, you know, you're constantly giving commands. And I like that you, it kind of pauses the action as you yeah. bring up the wheels and you tell them use this gun or use this ability. Right. You know, it's kind of like we've talked about that hybrid of action. And, yes, uh, that like what FF Seven Remake. Yeah. Did you know fairly well? You can't take direct control of the squad mates. Right. But you. But can, it's enough to give yeah. them commands that they can follow reliably, and then. I yeah. like it better that way, anyways, because the Me idea too. is that you're role playing a commander. Exactly. So you're not literally moving them. Well, like you're telling them yeah. what to do. It's like Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> you're the trainer. You're not the Pokemon. You're the trainer. You just tell it. Yeah. Do this, do that, right? So, yes. yeah, kind of the similar idea. Anyways, you fight inside. You go down into the dig site, and you find her sort of suspended in this, like, blue shield thing. And you, you don't know how long she's been there. Yeah. It's like she's been there for a while, especially because later on they're like, oh, you probably, you're probably kind of hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's like... Saren would have sent the Geth to get her, right? Yeah. So it would have been semi-recently, but like, yeah, like how long is she? Because she activated some 
Prothean technology they had dug up at, and she tried to put up like a shield, but it, it also trapped her. Yeah. And she doesn't really understand like how to turn it off or like what happened. So she's kind of stuck there, but she, at least she's protected from the Yeah, geth. all the geth, yeah. But she's also, yeah, stuck. Yeah. So we get there, um, we find, we, we kind of use this like cannon to like break through the rock and get into an elevator that gets up to there. And we get her out. And uh, you know you're kind of uh, getting here to come with you because it, it's like the you know, blast like made the rock unstable. It's like collapsing. Oh yeah, yeah. And so you're trying to race out before it, like the whole site collapses on mm -hmm. itself. Um, and we don't really trust her at first as well, right? Yeah. Because we don't know like anything about her other right. than who her mother is. <laughs> right. And it's like, oh, are you on Benezia's side? Yeah. And she's like, my mom. I she hadn't talked to her mom in a long yeah, time. Yeah. They don't have months. a great relationship yeah. or strained somehow. So it's like, all right. It's like, okay, well, you know, we'll bring you along. Um, Cause you might, you know, be able to help us locate her or give us more information right. about her or whatever. But you fight um, another Krogan mercenary yeah, on yeah, the yeah. way out. And this kind of led into my conversation with um, Rex when I got back to the Normandy mm -hmm. after this. But the, the Krogan, because they have the genophage, so they're slow, yes, they, yeah. they, their population is slowly dying out. On top of this, they're a very aggressive, warlike people to begin with. Yes, they are. They were sort of like put on that evolutionary path by mm -hmm. the Salarians to begin on with, purpose. to use them against the Rachni. Yeah. So it's basically the, the, the council race's fault yes. that the Krogan got elevated technology-wise to the level that they're at before they were really ready, right, before they're cultural evolution led them to a point where they would have discovered the the mass relays on their own and maybe yeah. would have lost some of these warlike tendencies, right? But then they gave them a genophage and like are committing genocide on them. I know. It's it's a messed up situation. So they're they're they fix one problem with a stupid solution that created another problem that they then fixed with another stupid solution. Yes. And that's turned them all against you and, and yeah. so the Krogan have been They've been done bad here. They've yes, been they done have. dirty here. And you're talking to Rex about it, and he's basically like, yeah, there are not a whole lot of Krogan scientists out there. It's not part of like our okay. natural... Yes. This conversation is fascinating, because at first we show up, and we're like, hey, <clears throat> um, talking about the Krogans and stuff, and he says, you know, we're, we're not respected, and, and Shepard would say something along the lines of, yeah, I know what you mean, you know, we humans aren't either. Yeah. And Krogan's like, or Rex is like, Really, you know what it you know what it's like to have your to be completely like uh, what would it be like neutered completely, yeah. or to make it so that your kids are genetically altered that all these babies are born either they die right after they're born or they're stillborn yeah. right away, and it's like one in a thousand that yeah. you might actually have a kid. You know what that's like, huh? <laughs> and Shepard would be like, uh, at least my playthrough. Yeah, I guess it's not exactly the same. And Rex goes through and he he explains all this stuff and how they. Um, like nobody's researching how to reverse this. And Shepard asked the question that I was thinking. I love yeah. it when this happens. Mm -hmm. When I'm like, well, dudes, why aren't you doing your it? thing? Yeah, why don't you research it? And he says, yeah, you don't see many Krogan scientists, do you? We're all we're a warlike people, right? And I, I think it, it's it's important. Shepard does a very good job of it within the options of. There's a high likelihood that whatever you're thinking is one of the options there, even in just a normal conversation with two people, yeah. right? And it's it's cool. So you're able to kind of throw that out there, like, hey, you know, you could like do this. And he he's saying that they their their genetics have been created to be only care about breaking stuff. They, yeah. That they don't ever have. They were set scientists. on that path. Yes, and it's the not their ends. fault completely. Yeah, right? and so I feel it's, like it's like an important like, point to bring up. Instead of the the instead of the species banding together to solve their genophage problem, yeah. they are like the Krogan are like predisposed yeah. to become mercenaries, not scientists. Yes. Yeah. They become warriors, not, you know, people doing research and science and stuff. You would think so, a problem like this would have yeah. the effect of more Krogans being interested in the sciences and how but to. But it's like they don't but want they just, to. They can't. Yeah, they can't. The, the naturally, as they grow up, it's just I have no interest in that. I want to yes. go f be a mercenary and fight. Yes. So they all leave the home world and they all yeah. go out and become mercenaries and just die and never they come back. They end up fighting each other often. Yeah. And, and yeah. And that's exactly what happens in this yeah. scene 
at the end of the Liard Dig Sites mission mm. is a Krogan comes down, and for me, I had Rex on the team, right? It's mm, like I can't remember if I did. I don't think I did. It's like every Krogan death is like a freaking tragedy I when know, you really yeah. think about it. That's true. It's like yeah, that's true. That we was end up a fighting one in several a thousand, a one in a thousand success. Yeah. Now they're fighting each other. Yeah. You've just like, you've just committed an atrocity yeah. Yeah. against your own species, but that's what they do. Yeah. So the, 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 the Krogan are a fascinating little like element to the story. And uh, anyways, you fight that Krogan who was sent by Saren to kill you. And uh, you get out and bring Liara back. And this is where she starts to explain, oh, we kind of missed this in the last episode. Shoot. Oh, did we? Um, we forgot to talk about... It's on the same memory card. Yeah, I'm going to probably edit this back into the other one. Uh, Tali, when you bring her in and she has the evidence for Saren, yeah. she reveals what else she found on that memory cube of the mm -hmm. Geth. And it's the fact that there's this, this um, sentient, inorganic, like robotic race called the Reapers. The Reapers, yeah. Who they believe are gods, who were the ones who wiped out the Protheans. The Geth believe they're gods. Yes. Yeah. The Geth believe that the Reapers are gods. They worship them like gods. Mm -hmm. And this is apparently the, uh, what, what ended the Prothean civilization, that wiped right. them out. And uh, uh, Shepard starts to put, oh, that's what I saw in my vision. <clears throat> right. I saw the Protheans being destroyed by, by the Reapers. The Reapers yeah. And so they try to bring that up in the council session, and they're like, oh, there's no hard evidence for that either. This is probably Yes, and that's some... where Shepard's like, well, I was right about the other thing. Yeah. Like, why don't we at least look into this one? Right. Yeah. So it's like, um, they're like, yeah, that's probably just some kind of, a, what's the word for it? Like, it, it, it's like setting you off the path of what his actual intentions are, right? Oh, it's a like diversion. A diversion or yeah, something. Yeah. It's not actually true. That's just like what they want you to think. Anyway, so they don't believe it. So that's, that context was set up on the Citadel mm -hmm. where you learned about the Reapers. And now Liara, as you bring her in, she starts to say that she has a feeling based on her decades and decades of research yeah. into the Protheans that, that the they Protheans, were not yes. the original uh, precursor race yeah, that, that they, created the Citadel and created the mass relays right. like everyone suspects they were. Now, the way she explains this, though, is interesting because she's very science-oriented and she's an archaeologist and she's looking for evidence but she has a, like, what is it, a gut a, feeling? Yeah, like a gut feeling or <laughs> premonition. The Protheans, but she's like, this is the truth. This is 100% it. I know I'm right, but I just don't have any evidence yet. It's like, I, I kind of see what the writers were doing with this. It's like, rather than make the scene yeah. another like 20 minutes of her <laughs> talking about explaining the evidence behind it, <sighs> she tries to say like, it's like a, it's like an appeal to authority kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. She's like, she's, I'm an authority on I, this. She's a hundred years old. There's and... not any one piece of evidence of the, like I said, decades and decades worth of research I've done that proves that what I'm saying is true. It's a culmination of all this stuff that I know, right. all this stuff that I have found, all of this stuff I have pieced together. The the preponderance it's, it's, of evidence. When you yeah. have the preponderance of it, yeah, this conclusion makes sense. But sure, I can't okay. give you the preponderance of my entire <laughs> career's worth of research in this meeting right now. Right. But I'm telling you that I'm right about this. Right. The Protheans were not the first. And she is right. And it was so funny uh, in that conversation where Shepard's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. They weren't the first. There was this other thing. And then... Also, the Reapers came up and killed all the Protheans. And she's like, what? <laughs> what are the Reapers? What are you talking about? How do you and know that? And we're like, oh, I, I had a dream. and you know, I had a vision because of this when Prothean beacon. we touched the beacon, exactly. And, she's, and, and she and knows she, how the beacons work. Yeah, she, so she's, she says she believes that us. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because they had these beacons that would transmit oh. all this knowledge into... But she's surprised that we even understood it and that right. it didn't just break our brains and, and right. Shepard just died right there. Right. So apparently that's what would happen. Happen, that this was made for an advanced people who have a higher level of thinking and that if were it to be given to someone like a human, they wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it. Sure. They would just like fall down and just be like, what is this? It doesn't make sense. My brain's confused and it just like 
breaks them. Right. And so he's able to take that and he's slowly piecing it together. He doesn't really understand it either. Right. But it didn't like destroy his life. His, yeah, it's his like mind. as context is being given, he's like, oh, it's that's like, what oh, I saw. The Reapers, yeah, I saw that. That's those. what I saw. Yeah. That's what I saw, right? It's like it's kind of slowly making sense more and more as time goes on. Yeah, and hopefully he's not misremembering anything because he's yeah. relying on his memory at this point. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, so anyways, that's more or less that first mission, the Liara's dig site mission, but she comes with you now. So she has kind of like a permanent space in the little sick bay area where she's yeah. doing her thing. Well, when she did this thing too, where our conversation with her ends really on an awkward note, not really on an awkward note, but then she gets really embarrassed and then she's like, yes. oh, oh, I put my foot in my <laughs> mouth, darn it's it. Because, oh, geez. Um, she's talking about being fascinated with Shepard as a potential... Yes. Um, research because candidate. of the dream right? and he's like oh or he or she would be like oh I'm really like that fascinating you want me to be your guinea pig or something like right. that so oh I didn't mean it like that I just thought you'd be a great specimen for whatever oh uh, that's worse oh whoops I, uh, I'm so <laughs> awkward I don't know how to talk to people <laughs> but here's the thing so she the voice acting for her isn't actually very awkward at all yeah she's it's actually good. pretty normal it's just yeah. a regular voice but the way what she's saying is oh geez I'm so awkward I don't know how to talk to people but what I'm getting is oh this is a normal person who definitely knows how to talk to people <laughs> do you know what uh, I found really funny <laughs> Though. I don't know if you what? noticed this. Um, Allie Hillis, who does the voice for her, she was lightning in Final Fantasy XIII. Oh, really? She does not speak with any contractions. Oh. Did you notice that? It's always I Did am I? or it is or I can't say that, that I noticed is it. or cannot or okay, no of contractions. Because she doesn't use contractions at all. Spock speak. Even, even when there are contractions, if you, like let's say you have the subtitles on. Ah. So you have the script there, in essence, okay. more or less. There will be contractions written but she in the text, but them. she doesn't use any contractions when she speaks. I feel like I noticed something weird about the way she was talking that seemed like that, but I didn't notice she that specifically. She does a really good job yeah. of making it sound pretty natural despite it. Hmm. There's like a, a, a time or two when it was like, that probably would have sounded more right. natural if it was can't instead of cannot, cannot or something. Cannot. But she did a pretty good job. Uh, voice talent did a pretty good job of making that work out and sound natural. She does a pretty good job. What I'd be saying is that she almost did too good of a job because she doesn't sound as awkward as the character seems to think she's sounding. And yeah. it could be that this is all intentional, that the character was never meant to sound that awkward. She's just being weird she just about it. She thinks she yeah. is. And so, she's and that's, that makes sense. That's fine. But the way she's talking, I'm thinking more of like a frantic, you know, librarian who dropped her glasses. <laughs> you know, like I feel like I've seen this character somewhere before, sure. and it's not quite what I'm getting from this this uh, alien here. Right. So, anyways, um, that's kind of the the big reveal. Yeah. So, like at the end of the Citadel section, the big reveal was Reapers took out the Protheans. Right. Now it's Protheans were not the actual precursor race right. that. Uh, likely were not the ones who created the Citadel the or created yeah. the mass relays. They were beneficiaries <laughs> of someone who came before them, before them. And that cycle's been going on for who knows how long. Yeah, which is funny. This is the Tolkien like um, idea of the mythology and how things delineate, I guess. What's yeah. the word? The, the evolution, things tend to evolve, devolve, devolve, is that it? They tend to evolve to become worse over time as opposed to be better. So the re the great civilizations were the really old ones and then as each subsequent civilization has been like less like good less and, and less, less good, good. And, but they're all just standing on the shoulders of the giants who yeah. came who came beforehand. It seems to be kind of where this where this game is headed a little bit. Mm. So then after that you head to Novaria, or you could go to Pharos, but we decided to go to Novaria. Or you can go to tons of other planets. Novaria is a really long mission. It was. Um, it's actually, like, the Citadel, every time I did it, no matter how much I knew what I was doing, mm -hmm. it's about three hours to complete the Citadel. Mm -hmm. Sounds about If right, you're yeah. doing everything. That yeah, to talking do. to everyone, doing all the mini quests. Um, Novaria was a similar thing. It was, like, about three hours to get through that. Yeah. And I was like, dang, this is a long mission, because you first arrive, and it's kind of in the like the the colonized city place yeah. where and, and Novaria seems to be mostly run by like corporations yes so when you mentioned in the last episode you mentioned that the humans brought their capitalism and their <laughs> their um 
I don't know, just the competitive, ju- brought, they brought humanity, aggressive expansion. Yes, the into, I- into you know the galactic um, alliance, and the alliance doesn't want to completely lose that because the exploitive nature of humans, while it has very many negative sides, also carries with it the great exploitation of resources and sure. other things, and the buying and purchasing of goods at low prices and all the stuff that humans <laughs> Low, low prices. So What's the uh, Tim and Eric sketch? Oh my uh, gosh, we have the I'm best prices. I'm selling premium prices. $8.99, dollars <laughs> uh, $19.99 for 20 bucks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eric, and welcome to Eric's Premium Prices. I've got all the premium prices. I've got $19.99 for sale for $20. You come to me when you want fine European prices. They're premium. Come on in, buy $35.50 for $40. Oh, lay an egg. Go to Tim's discount prices. Our $6.99s are down to $2.99. Uh, Anyways. <laughs> my prices are cheap, cheap, cheap. Anyways. Don't go to his store. <laughs> okay, so. That, that's what we're talking about yes. with humanity. Like. That's it. Humanity is so good at those prices, man. We're so good. And they, the competition. So they don't want to lose that. And this this planet here is a great example of that, right? Yeah. You've got all the different, um, like, I th- there's a lot of people with Japanese names specifically on this planet, I remember. Uh, but it's a lot of humans that are there. Yeah. A lot of humans. And um, we show up. And, yeah, it seems to be very corporate, very bureaucratic but not so much in a government-ish way necessarily yeah. the government's there but like the police are only there to mediate between the corporations and they actually kind of let the corruption go yeah. like they don't they're not there to actually enforce their laws necessarily yeah i think i can't remember if it's the attican traverse or if it's the terminus systems that run because we're pursuing saren outside of citadel space mm. so these places yeah they're not they're kind of outskirts i'm trying to remember is novaria necessarily on the outside of Citadel space because they still respect his specter status. Yes, but that's one of the few things. So so they they respect it, but I don't know, that may have more to do with the fact that, well, we better do what the Alliance wants. Not that they're subservient to them, but that like, well, if a specter shows up, yeah, we may as well. So, so they, they no one's to... allowed to have guns in this whole place. Let me actually except look that Except for up. a specter or their police. It's privately chartered by the Novaria Development Corporation, so the, the whole planet is privately chartered, mm-hmm. who lease out labs to perform research um, too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere. What can go wrong? Oh, I know, seriously. So I think it might be in Citadel space. Okay. Novaria, but it's the a planet special... is privately chartered. Okay. And so... So China would call this a special economic zone, <laughs> an SEZ. Sure. Yes, where they are allowed to kind of do some other things that most people, other people can't. I think, here's the codex entry. Novaria is a cool, rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Novaria Developmental Corporation holding, co- or the, the Novaria Development Corporation holding company. The mm. NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high technological development firms and administrated by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Novaria's surface. These facilities are used to research too da- or, or used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere. As Novaria is technically not part of Citadel space, there we go. There you go. And therefore so exempt not. from council law. Okay, so they are on the outskirts. But they still seem to respect his specter status because it's here. I don't think they're, uh, they have to though. They're under no obligation to do it. They just, they, they choose to do it. So huh. the corporations have said, hey, let's let the specters in here. We don't want to, we don't want no trouble. But they uh, like agreed to do it. It wouldn't be like the government says, you have to do this. They, they're doing it on their own. Because hmm. it says by special arrangement, <clears throat> Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents, specters, mm have been granted extra ter- uh, extraterritorial privileges. So it's a separate arrangement, yeah. But it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. See, yeah, so it's as I thought. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, so it is outside of Citadel space. So it's outside of Citadel space because they're doing things that would otherwise be completely illegal. Yes. And scientists can't just not do those things. <laughs> they have to do them. They're going to find a place to do their it's crazy not, experiments. It's not a matter of whether you gonna can find, or whether you should yes. or whatever. Yes, you didn't stop to think. So okay. anyway. So yeah, but the way these labs are set up, and this is a crazy thing about the Novaria system, 
they have like a heat activation where they could melt the ground or the glaciers underneath yeah. the lab and just sink the whole lab if yeah. something goes wrong. Right. right. So that they couldn't discover what they were doing. Yes. Yeah. And also to contain whatever yeah. possible contagion might be coming out of there. <laughs> right. But um, is this the this is where Matriarch showed up, right? So, so the, yeah, we Matriarch Benezia here. came here. Yeah. Um, to so Saren has some investment with one of the companies yeah. that that operates here, right? So he's like an investor in yeah, one of investor. the companies. Yeah, and so some, Benezia is coming on his behalf officially yeah. to order or for some sort of business or to, to order things. She was bringing things. For Saren. And she brought, she brought these big boxes. That they didn't look into. Yes. They didn't investigate what she was bringing in yes, at all. Because yes. that's part of what they do. They allow people to do illegal stuff here. They allow people to be illegal, yeah. You, but you can't have a gun. They banned guns yes. from normal people. To in in the, like, but the Spectres, main hub. Yeah, Spectres area. can have guns, but nobody else. Yes, except the and police. so, anyways, Benezia had recently come there. She's at uh, yeah. Peak Fifteen. Peak Fifteen, that's which what is they call where it. the lab of whatever corporation that Sarah yeah, is an investor remember. in. I can't remember yeah. the name of it right now, but she's up there. And it's like, okay, we need to go up there and talk to her. It's like, well, you can't leave. You have to have a special a special permit mm -hmm. to leave the garage and to like take a vehicle up there to the. Oh, because there was like a big storm. There was like a big blizzard yeah. or something. They didn't want to fly in, and so we're like, well, we could drive, but then we needed a special permit. But uh, but on top of that, they just don't want people investigating yes, the companies. Yes, they so don't it's want like people going there. You have to have a there. permit to go to any of these labs <clears> in the first place. So you have to get a permit from the company. Yeah. In order to go visit it. Yeah. And so, and anyways, then, there's all this red tape. Yes. You have to go through in order to leave. They will not let you leave. They'll let you on, they'll let you into the colony, they'll let you keep your guns, they'll let you mm. ask questions, but they won't let you go up to the labs, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, to any of the, the peak stations or whatever. So one of the bureaucrat people, one of them just whispers to us like, hey, you're not getting anywhere here. Go talk to this person privately. It's the secretary, secretary of Analeas. Oh yes. Who yeah. was the Solarian like. Solarian. I don't know if he's like the, he's on the board or he's, he's one of the up. executives who's kind yeah. of running the place, right? Yeah. And he kind of doesn't give you the time of day. He yeah, answers your questions out of like obligation, but right. like he's not really giving you the information you want. Yeah, he but is. his secretary says, hey, it's clear that you don't know how things yeah. operate in exactly. a corporate system like this. Right. Um, I'll give you a leave. Because secretly, she's investigating Analeas and yes. she's trying to gather the um, the info or the evidence she needs to arrest him. And so she kind of sets you off on that path, but she's obviously been embedded for a while. Mm -hmm. She's not trying to blow her cover yet. So you go talk to this Turian guy. So Lorik Kane is the name of the Turian. Yeah, and he's like, isn't he a cop himself or something? No, he's, he's, he, doesn't. He, he got in trouble. He's under investigation. His company is yes. under investigation by Analeas. Ah. Uh. Um, and so he's been locked out of his office, right? But he has certain evidence against Analeas, which is why he's been shut down. Mm. So Analeas is not <coughs> investigating him. He's trying to get rid of the evidence against him that is on Laura <laughs> yeah. Keene's computer in his office. And so anyways, you go talk to Laura Keene and he's like, okay, if you help me mm. like get that stuff from my computer in my office, I will get you a permit to leave uh, the port and right. go up to peak, go up to peak fifteen, like you want to do. And it's like you might have to fight some cops while you're up there, who are they're not they're bad cops, they're dirty cops, they're cops who are actually working for Analeas, right. right? But it's like, oh, we have to, you know. Again, if you try to go Paragon. Shepard will never agree to do this because it's technically not right, legal. Right, yeah. So you have to at least go the neutral route to even proceed on and this then, quest And then just, okay, I'll try not to kill anybody. <laughs> yes, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> I know. Um, but also, a lot of these cops will kind of, uh, isn't there some, there's something where the, kind of one of the police leaders says like, oh, typically we don't allow police to hire to be hired out as mercenaries yes. or uh, as, uh, to have a side job or anything yes. like that because their only skill is they're allowed to carry a gun and right. they, you know, people will hire them often for these nefarious reasons. And so these cops, but it keeps happening. It's just yeah. always happening because the whole place is so corrupt. 
Yeah. And it's hard for them to keep it. This is basically a corporate world with no government regulation. Yeah. It's essentially what Novaria is. (laughs) (laughs) What would what would capitalism look like with zero (laughs) regulation on it? That's a Galt's Gulch. Yes. But and this isn't quite Ayn Rand's dream, but (laughs) This is what ha- this is it's, what this is what happened here. I guess it's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyways, yeah, you go into there, and there's a bunch of Analeas's dirty cops there, like trying to find the evidence, and you have to end up getting into a firefight to recover it. Uh, one of the one of the officers that like approached you when you first got there, because they try to like shut you down when you first show up. Like, who are you? It's yeah. like I'm a specter. Well, you're gonna have to turn over your weapons. It's yes. Like, no. I'm a specter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're they're like, going to fight. They're gonna ready to die. Yeah. And like, it's like, you're not a specter. There's no such thing as a human specter. Like, yes. what are you talking about? You're lying that's the other. Specter. That's the funny thing about this whole system is that they're kind of behind. They're yeah. not as informed. Yeah. They don't know exactly what's going on. We find this out later when we get to the lab. Um, they don't know exactly what's been going on. They didn't know that um, Saren has gone rogue. They didn't mm. know a lot of stuff that they would have known where they kind of plugged in to yeah to the alliance Citadel system space. so they just didn't know this stuff so yeah that's kind of funny they're a little bit behind and that's you know a, a consequence of trying to get out away from the regulation and exactly but out. anyways uh, one of the cops who approached you there and was being really aggressive with you she's there and she ends up trying to fight you to take the evidence that you recovered from yeah. Lord Kane's computer so you have to fight her kill her you I go, didn't think she she because she shows up and it, it didn't seem like we were gonna have to kill her at first, <laughs> yeah. but um, she's like, yeah, she's one of the bad ones, I guess. Yep. So you take her out and you go back, and then this is where the secretary lady comes to you again. She's like, before you take that to Laura Keane, come see me first. Mm. I have another offer. So what she wants is for Keane to testify against ah, Analeas yes, yes, yes. publicly. Yeah. Because that will allow her to arrest him and to finish her investigation of Analeas. And right, and Keen's pissed because we had an agreement. Yeah, she was like, now that you own my yeah. property, you're going to dictate how I use it. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I think if you go Paragon there, because I didn't get this far in my Renegade playthrough. Okay. If you go Paragon there, though, you basically say, look, everybody hates Analeas. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way that he's running things around here you could end up being a hero to all the companies right, by yeah. taking him down. And it's like, <laughs> He's I like, guess I can't argue against that. That's all right. <laughs> fine, I'll testify. <laughs> right? So you can yeah. you can either do that or not, I guess. You could choose to not help her out. But mm-hmm. if you do, then she ends up arresting Analeas, and that kind of concludes the whole sort of investigation in the port there at the beginning. Yeah. Of but like the really long part of the mission comes when you actually leave there because the geth attack you in the garage. And, and they don't believe us at first. We're like, there's yes. a geth here. And they're like, there's no geth here. Yeah. But it's like, no, you guys didn't freaking check the matriarch's boxes. Yes. And she That's brought a bunch of geth. That's how she got the geth in here. And they're like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> so now as we're driving around, we're being attacked yep, <laughs> like all the time all as we're going. Up. Yeah, and so, crazy. anyways, you finally get up to the Peak 15 station, Rift Station, I think they call it, and it's just infested with geth, and it's infested with rachni. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. holy crap, wait, because, because your squad mates almost don't believe it at first. Like, yeah. this can't be the rachni. They were, right. they were wiped out thousands of years ago. Yeah. What are you talking about? So apparently an egg was found floating in space. Mm-hmm. That was still viable. It was almost like cryosleep. Thousands of Natural years later. Natural cl- cryosleep yes, for this yes. egg. <laughs> so in the, crazy. In the cold space, right? And it, lucky for the species, the species only needs one person to, to procreate. Yep, so just a queen. Yeah. It was a queen egg. And, and so now there's tons <coughs> of them everywhere. The way that the arachni work is they inherit. It's almost like a union concept. They inherit yes, the genetic knowledge, yeah. memories and knowledge of their ancestors. Yeah. The queens do. So... The queen, this queen, essentially knows everything about the Rachni's history. Right. She knows the whole Rachni she war. It. Yeah. She knows everything about the whole history of the Rachni. So, like, the entire culmination, the whole race is contained in this one queen, basically. Yeah. Um, we'll get to the queen a little bit later when we get to the end of the sec- sequence. And, but And so the Rachni themselves don't have the knowledge, but the queen does. Yes. But the Rachni will listen to the queen. The yes. queen has complete control over them. But, but not these. Not Rachni these ones. That are attacking you. 
Yes. Because, well, they were separated, right? Yes. The queen is somewhere else, right. and they're trying to study the rachni alone, but the rachni are just freaking out and going crazy. Yes. Probably just like, where's the queen? Where's the queen? Where's our mom? We need, we don't know what to do. The, the way that they explain this later on is almost like, what if you separated a baby mm. at birth and just it lived in a closet until it was 15? Right. What, what chance would you have of ever really communicating with a person who didn't develop language, yeah. didn't develop like... Uh, social connection. Mm -hmm. It's like basically the conclusion they come to is that these um, rachni have to be euthanized. There's no chance of acclimating them. Like it's, it's they're too far gone at this point. And what's funny is that there's two ways to do this Novaria section. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about the way that you did it. When you get, find like the commander guy and he's like, Matriarch Benezi is down in the hot labs. Yeah. Did you take his word for it and just go straight down into the hot labs and meet the crazy scientist guys? Like, we have to kill them, uh, ac activate the neutron burst and kill all the rachni. Yes. Yeah. You just went straight there? Yeah. Well, I okay. think so, because I don't know what the other option was. I did go there and meet that guy. If you can't do that the other way, then yes, that's the one I did. So you but can there's go, so many variables. You can go there and meet with him. He tells you to go to the hot labs. And you go yes. down there and you, and you you basically wipe out all the little rachni yeah. with a neutron burst, right? And he's like, it's a very sad thing, but we have to neutralize. Like, oh, and he, he's like a heavy Russian. Totally accent. ungovernable, you know. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to go down to the hot labs. You can go back into like where all those scientists are at and do more investigation in there and talk to people oh, really? and find out what's really going on and get into where Matriarch Benezi is without going to the hot labs at all. Really? Okay, yeah, I didn't if do that. If you do that, that, was that not what I the Rachni Queen will tell you herself those rachni can't be saved. Destroy them. Oh, okay. I can't, uh, my music can't reach those yes. rachni. They're unsavable. Okay. And you're like, well, if you say so, like if, if that's what you're telling me I have to do, I guess I'll, then you go into the hot labs afterwards and you activate the neutron burst and kill them and the rachni queen gives you the, her blessing to do that. Well, interesting. Which is freaking crazy. That's freaking crazy. I had no, I, I'd never played it that way. Really? In any of my playthroughs before. Wow. The Rachni Queen tells you That's so those children, it's, it's, it's like trying to talk to a, an adult human who never had any association with humans hmm. in their whole life. It's, it, they, there's certain parts, their neural networks have been set yeah. and they're not going to be able to adapt to normal society. They're just not going to yeah. be able to do that. You have to learn that stuff as a baby. Right. Right. So that's the concept is that these Rachni cannot be... They cannot be like, what would you call it? Reprogrammed or like, she can't f like bring them back in or, or you know, like uh, tame them or anything like that. So when she was talking about music and plucking strings and all that stuff, I, I, I listened to that whole conversation, but since I had already done that, I actually didn't actually get the relevance, exactly yeah. what she was talking about yeah. when I did it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I believe we did mention the kids, but she's going off on some tangent about music and I'm, I, I, it kind of went over my head a little bit there. Yeah. I didn't realize that that's what she was saying. She yeah. was like, yeah, kill them. You can kill the kids. Because it's that's like fine. they can sort of speak mind to mind and she's using this music yeah. analogy, analogy to try to like get across the concept. And that's yeah. how she's controlling the Asari commando who's almost dead. Yes. It's like she, because she's weak, I can use my music plucking to like pull on her strings. Mm. But another person who's otherwise healthy or whatever would be able to resist or something like that, right? Yeah. I'm so. remembering too, we've, we've um, skipped over the computer AI that, or VI, yes, I guess. The, the VI, like, activating the VI, the VI system. That everything. runs yeah. all of this. I stuff. got way ahead of myself. Let's skip that. <laughs> so the, it's, the place is overrun by Rachni. <laughs> Yes. And you're fighting your way through and like the whole station is like powered down. So like the tram doesn't work. A lot of the elevators don't work. The VI yeah. has Well, because they're in lockdown, off. right? Yeah, like, they're like something in, went wrong and they're like Because And somebody shut down, I think it was Matrix but Bezina, she uh, shut down the computer that runs all of this stuff. Yes. Like on purpose. Like, boom, shut it yeah. all down and the whole lab is just completely shut down. Right. So you have to go through, the level is activating these systems, yeah. turning the VI on by moving the memory into a different like core, a different like drive, or you can just use OmniGel. It's a little mini game where you have to like pull out the little drives and like move mm -hmm. them over. Yeah, yeah, so like the middle one's blue the and the <laughs> other ones are red. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so anyways, you get that all activated and turned on. You actually take the tram over to where 
the, the, some of the soldiers and mercenaries are. And that's where he, he tells you, I think his name is something with a V. Can't remember the dude's name. He tells you Matriarch Benezia is down in the hot labs. So most people are probably just gonna go down to the hot labs and take his word for right. it, not realize that they're trying to, they're working for Benezia. They're trying mm -hmm. to like keep you from interfering. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they want to er eliminate all these Rachni that have gotten out of hand. So what they were doing there is essentially trying to raise a Rachni army. Saren wanted a Rachni army. That's what this whole mm. lab was doing. Mm. They found the egg, they birthed the queen, they birthed a bunch of little Rachni soldiers, but they separated them from the, from the queen. So they thought they could then use them as an army, but without the influence of the queen on them, they just go berserk and they can't control them at all. And so then they overran the station and the Rack and I are out killing all the scientists. Yeah. And that's what went wrong here. That's why Benezia showed up with Geth to try to get a whole a handle on the situation. Mm. <laughs> so that Saren sent her there to do that. So that's what's going on. But you can learn about the truth of what's happening by not going straight down to the hot labs, going back behind and talking to the different scientists, and there's a whole bunch of different other things you can do. Interesting. So, anyways, the long and short of it is that you have to fight your way through. Once the mercenaries find out that you're learning too much, you end up having to fight them mm -hmm. to get into where Benezia is with the Rachni queen, and you end up fighting Benezia. But what you learn is that Benezia is more or less being mind controlled by Saren. What did what did you what do you make of that? Well, it seems on Sorry. its face like it's kind of a tropey cop out thing. It's like mind control right. is kind of an easy way <laughs> yeah. of making oh, I can't I'm control, still a good person. I'm still good. But but there <clears throat> as we've mentioned many times there there is no forgiveness or whatever. Yeah. Yes. So even if you're being mind controlled you have to die. That, <laughs> That's that right. is, we talked about this in the Xenogear. That podcast. is how this works, um, um, because it's still you doing it in some way or another. But yeah, and some of once the, you've done really bad things, you have to. I die. really found that a lot of the execution on this scene in particular was kind of clumsy. Yeah. Um, yes. From the animation yes. side yes, of things, yes, the animations for to, sure. And yours was probably smoother animation than mine. So maybe I, I'm probably well, the not. new version of the game. Yeah, it's it's, it's like the animations are still the same. Oh, okay. It's mostly just textures are updated. Okay. And lighting is updated, but the 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 animations are pretty much the same. They're the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was some clumsy stuff right there with the so, game. and and even performance clumsiness I found. Yeah. Um, Did you have um, light Liara? Liara in the party. In the party. I did have her in the party. Yeah, me too. Um, I didn't buy her actual sadness of her mother dying. It was, it, it feels like a glossed over, not like fully yeah. fleshed out scene from a direction perspective. Sure. It's like, almost just feels like it's rushed through. Mm. So it's like, I don't really yep. feel the mother-daughter connection between yeah. Liara and Benezia. It just went through the motions. And yeah. it's like, okay, I get what they're trying to do. Didn't really mean much. And we didn't really know much about the matriarch. So it's very strange to, and it's funny because we did Final Fantasy VIII where Matriarch, <laughs> Matriarch word, uh, Matron. Matron uh, Idea, yeah. Anyways, we don't have to go <laughs> and spoil anything. But so um, the Matriarch, she, um, this is our very first scene with her really, other than she said like two sentences to Saren before, but other than that, this is the first time that we've met her. And she immediately is like, um, not who we thought she was at all, and then she dies. <laughs> yeah. And then it's over. And it's like, okay, I don't know what that scene was supposed to mean, or it would probably have been uh, more impactful were uh, Liara to have a moment with the matriarch like previous to this yes. time where we were able to see that but not knowing in that same scene yes. that, oh, she's being mind controlled. Matriarch Benezia does not get a nearly enough screen time for right. this scene for this. to work at all. Yes, yeah. The only other time we saw her was in the scene directly after Eden Prime where Saren like grabs her face and he's all pissed at her because she reported that, yes, that uh, Shepard uh, activated Made the, contact. Yeah, made contact with the beacon. Yeah. 
outside of that scene, we know you nothing. don't see Matrix Benezia yeah. at all until this moment. And to have it go like this was, it just felt weird. I, I feel like we needed more. I guess y y it, it wouldn't be known that Liara was going to be in your party if you're a first time player anyways. Yeah. I probably just got lucky, but <laughs> that's like, that's true. It's almost worse if Liara's with yeah, you than exactly. if she wasn't. It's almost like if she wasn't there, then would this be, would actually would have been a lot better. better. It would have felt better. I agree so, with that. You know what? Maybe that's the issue here. Maybe the, the problem is more the fact that, we, as you mentioned, you're almost, it, it almost seems like the game wants you to not do Lyra's excavation site, site first. first. Yeah. That you maybe should have done this other one first, right? Is that... I, I don't know if that's in, if that's what they wanted, but it, it but I the feel fact like that it would even feel have the more option. natural that way. Yeah, because it feels like this should be a really sad or touching or emotional moment if Liara is there. Yeah. If Liara is not there, I don't know you. You don't know me. And and we kill her. And Who it's cares? Over. Yes. So it would have been way better if I, th I think that is it. So if Lyra was not there, it would have been much better. Lyra, there's a one in three chance that you did get her first, anyways. Yes before doing that particular place. This right. is one of the, this is, I think this all comes back to the complexity of designing a game like this with yeah. so many choices, right? There's like, like so many Does the director take variables. a ton of time and coach the actors and really get a good emotional scene here that one tenth, because even if you do get Liara, who's gonna have her in their party when this scene happens, yeah. you know? It's like a one in 10 me. Now, if you, do, if you have recruited Liara, but she's not currently in your party, when you first arrive at Novaria. Your, yeah. your party members will say, hey, if Benezzi's here, what do you think about going back and getting Maybe Liara that's why first? I had her. Okay, so it's not so much a coincidence. So they do point you towards, maybe you should put her in the party. Okay. If she's in your squad. So it's like more one in three, maybe. But if she's, yeah, like a 30-ish percent chance yeah. that you're gonna see the scene with when Liara's with you. Right. I don't know if that's like, the best scientific arrival at a 30% chance. It, it may not be. Higher. There's probably but other anyways, other there are other variables. That, yeah. But yes, at the point is... It's a low is, chance that, that that would go that way, you know? And it would the scene actually would work better without her, so... Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, and then also, because you fight her, right? Or you fight her commandos in a geth, and she's like using her powers, and then she's getting weaker. She's using her biotic powers. Yeah. And then, and then and she's, she's like, the "Oh, I, thing. I, I fought him off for one moment to just try to describe what's really happening here." Right. There's more to it than just, "Oh, he's mind controlling me because Saren's well, evil." Saren got. She does explain some it. Some kind of power from the mothership. It's, it's the ship, exactly. Yeah. And it was like I. It, it, there was, it was almost this like slow, gradual process where like you just started to feel like everything he said made sense. Yes. It yeah. wasn't like all of a sudden he's just mind controlling me. Mm -hmm. It was like over time and I thought I could resist it, I couldn't anymore. I just, there yeah. was just a, a feeling inside of me that slowly grew well, and where so I just felt like I couldn't go against what he was telling me. Well, the smart thing that she did, which I guess the, is it Asarian? What is her race? Asari, yeah. Asari, the, uh, that they can do more or less. She kind of partitioned like a part of her mind a little bit so that yes. it was separated from right. the effects of whatever she was going right. through day to day so that she could recover it in a moment like this where she needed to be candid and actually honest and tell people what she felt like. Yeah. Um, it almost feels like to me, and I guess this is sort of a guess on my part, but that it would be kind of cool if Saren was in this ship and the idea is, oh no, the ship is helping Saren and everything he says makes sense, but it's also that the ship is actually controlling Saren and that it seems as though everybody is like subservient to Saren, but Saren himself is actually subservient to another thing that's controlling him, that they, but they think that it's him, but it's actually this other thing. So I'm not going to comment on that, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> and you, you can, I don't expect you to, I know, we're back in the territory of me just like guessing wildly, but otherwise it doesn't make sense that Saren found this ship, he finds a ship, and he controls it, and it, through, through it he can control other people. It would make a lot more sense that the ship would be the one yeah. in charge. We will learn more about what exactly is happening with that. A it's a bit weird later. power, at least from what we know of the world. But 
Yeah. It's like no one can do that. According so to the what, fact that Saren could, it's just interesting. According to what Benezia is saying, something to do with that mothership that attacked Eden Prime is has given Saren the ability to sort of like control people. Right. And that it's it's not just you know something what? it's sudden, I didn't it's even I didn't even sudden. make that freaking connection. It's that ship. Yes. The tentacle ship. The tentacle ship I from didn't, Eden Prime. I didn't even make a connection that that was it, that that's the ship. That's the ship that Saren is on. Well, in some ways, I didn't even think that that was a ship. It seemed like yeah. a Cthulhu, like a monster. Yeah, like a monster thing. almost. <laughs> yeah. Dang, that's crazy. So that, that ship that he's on, there's something about that. Okay, so now it makes a little more sense that, that it can have some mind control will kind of thing. Right. Okay, so it's not just a ship. Because they are—they keep talking up how great our ship is, you know, the Normandy. And then it's like, well, wait, but Saren's ship's like a million times better. So yeah, so that's what's going on with the mind okay. control stuff. But it's, I just feel like the execution of delivering this information in the scene is a little yeah. clumsy and a little yeah. rushed, particularly rushed. Agree. It just feels like they're really rushing through this and they didn't do a lot of good setup to it to pay it off here. Yeah. Um, and so on top of that, she gets kind of, oh, I can't fight him off anymore. And, and Lyra's yeah. like, no, mother, you have to fight him. Forever. And she can't, and she's like, die. And so then you fight her one more time and kill her. Briefly. You don't really kill her, though. You just snap her out of it again. And then she's like, I can't stop him from controlling me, so I'm going to kill myself. Yes. But... The animation is so awkward that I did not awkward. I did not understand what was happening. Yeah. She just kind of like sits back there and all of a sudden she's like, oh. She leans over. No, and then she <laughs> says, she has a line. She goes, um, they said that there would be, would be a, a light. light. And, then, uh, and that's uh, that. I always thought there'd be a light. They said there'd be a light. And I was yeah. like, what is, what is this? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. almost like they're trying to work in this idea that like there's no afterlife, but it yes, just seems it so seems. out of place because like, what does it have yeah, to this do? this philosophical. What does that philosophical point have yeah. anything to do with anything in the game so far? Oh, so far, nothing. So far, zero. Like, I don't know it, if we it don't comes know in about, later. We don't know about the Sar Asari's belief systems or their no, religion. We don't. Although we don't. there is at the Normandy after this mission, at least with Ashley, there's a you can have a discussion with her where she invokes some religious beliefs. Uh, but it's yeah, not, yeah, that's true. But it's not along the lines of this at all. Because she believes in God. Yeah. Ashley does. And she's like, isn't that weird? Anyways, we can talk she's, about that she's, later. She's but, like, oh, you look outside. How can you not believe in God? Yeah. Kind of thing, right? But like, yeah, like we don't know about the Asari's religious beliefs as a culture. We, we've not had any any philosophical setup to is there an afterlife or is it even important to yes. the plot of this game. Yes. And she just throws out so, this random line. It's just an anecdote. About, oh, I thought there would be a and, light. And I have oh, kind no. of a cynical take on that, which is that that line was thrown in for the edgy teenagers to like, it's what like it feels just like. an idea for them to be like, Oh, you know, that's so deep. What if there isn't a Even light or if that you know? wasn't the intention. The adults lied. It feels like that. It feels like that. It yeah. feels clumsy yeah. like that. And it really needed a snappier, more impactful animation for how whatever she's mm -hmm. doing to herself. To whether kill she herself. breaks her own neck. Yeah, or that whether she been better. I don't know. Something. But then she couldn't say the line. But she kind of just falls over. It, but it, not even to the ground. She falls like 45 or she like slumps. <laughs> it, it, and it's not like she... And I don't have any clue what happened. It's yeah. like, did you kill yourself? Did, should, should, what did you yeah. do? Anyways... The whole scene is is kind of rushed and clumsy. It is, and the way it all wraps up is pretty clumsy too, because you just wind up gone and in your ship like yeah. pretty quick after that, right? Yeah. Like you don't like go back and talk to people. It's just kind of like over. Yeah, kind of just a weird it, it, way it, to you end. You have it. you have a little bit of like a group meeting where they kind of all sit in and and they're yeah. kind of testy, right? I think that what happens yes. is, is um, well, Liara, Ashley's upset with Liara. Liara starts making a suggestion about what to do next. And, and Ashley's, Ashley's like, who a, made you the one in charge? But, but I think that's because Ashley's upset that Liara, that there's a rumor there's a that Liara and Shepard are Shepherd. like, you know, yeah. getting close. Well, she also just doesn't like aliens generally. Like, you can talk to her even before yes. I think you recruit Liara. She does. And she's say. like, should we be giving access to our, uh, our, you know, our systems? And like, these are Alliance secrets, right? This is like yeah. a state-of-the-art vessel. Why is Tali in the engine room, you mm -hmm. know, like learning about how our, how our drives work? Right. And why are we giving access to Rex and Garrison? And I mean, there's a point to be made it is there. A, but she's obviously, <laughs> good question. 
she's obviously got some, and even Presley some does too, prejudice, yeah. some prejudice against yeah. aliens. Yep. Um, and so, you know, if you're a Paragon person on this playthrough, you're like, no, we need to take help where we can get it. Right. And we need to learn to trust and work with aliens. And, right. and whether you like it or not, like, you're going to have to do that. Really, is that a problem? So, no, it's not a problem, <laughs> yeah, sir, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But anyway, so she has a problem with aliens anyways. And then Liara, who she thinks is stealing her man, <laughs> is, <laughs> is making suggestions about what to do and trying to take over. And, and she's, she's like, like, shut up. Stop. Shut up, you. Yeah. And, and then and Command, uh, Commander Shep Shepard is like, okay, listen, we're all on edge a little bit. Yeah. Let's take a break. Oh, and at the end of each of these missions, uh, Joker's like, hey, this, the council is uh, yeah, asking a for a message. report. Yeah. Or you want me to patch you through? Yeah. You can say yes or no to that, but then you kind of report what happened. And they can they sit there and they question your judgments. Yes, and yes, And they're like, yes. what you did. So like on um, on the dig site mission on Therum, um, they'll be like, was it really necessary to like lose that dig site and like bury all that Prothean technology? Yes, like, they're actually, really upset about that. Yeah, one. it's like you just lost all of this stuff yeah. that could have been like you know integral research. It's like, right. yeah, actually, I did have to do that in yes. order to get her out. In order, so. <laughs> exactly. That was more important because the mission was her, not, the, not the dig site. Eventually, they'll be like, okay, we'll default to your judgment on right. that kind of and thing. For this one, it was allowing oh, yes. the, the Rachni yes. mother. Oh, we didn't even say that. Did after we? Benezia dies, yes. an Asari command, Shepard is walking up to observe the Rachni queen who's sort of in like a tank, like a giant tank thing, yeah. uh, trapped in there. And an Asari commando who you killed stands up and sort of like walks over and, and the Rachni is controlling it and is speaking mm. to you through. Like, um, it's what like, was that movie? It's, uh, it's Independence Day. Welcome dude. to Earth. Yeah, Independence, Independence Day. Day. Straight up Independence Straight Day. Straight up Independence that Day. That is so great. Um, yeah, like using the Asari commando as a mouthpiece and starts no talking to you. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. piece. Um, and essentially explains, uh, first of all, that it understands why what happened happened where the Arachne yes. were wiped out yeah. you know, thousands of years ago. But on top of that, explains to you the whole way that the Arachne communicate and the mm. whole music's concept and the fact that her Arachne children are irredeemable or can't be saved at this point. It was actually and, a good, kind of a difficult conversation to follow. Yes. Because she's communicating just in a, in a foreign way to English speakers. Very abstract. Yes. Very... Concepts. Yeah. Trying to like make sense of the way that they think yeah. with language, which is not what they use. No. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, you ha can make a choice here. She she asks you, "Will you free me, mm. or will you end my race?" Right. And you can choose to either allow the Rachni queen to go and not commit genocide against all Rachni, mm -hmm. or you can kill her. Right. And that's what the Citadel Council really questions you on if you decide to. Let, let them go. The Rachni Queen go. Yeah. Because this was, I mean, a massive war. Right, it threatened every, ago. the entire alliance. And, yeah, and everybody. Shepard tries to explain, like, this Rachni Says, Queen is different. I promise you they won't do it again. <laughs> and understands yeah. why it had yeah. to be done, and this will not be a problem again. It's like, well, I hope you're right, because right. Our, our grandchildren will pay the price. Exactly. If you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this will have an effect, not just on this game, this choice, but on the whole series. Oh, really? The Rachni, mm. um, saving the Rachni Queen or not, is something that carries over into future mm. Mass Effect games. So I, I, I thought that was really cool. There's a couple of places in the game that have an effect not just on this game's ending or something, mm. but on future. Because they had planned it out as a trilogy from the yeah, start. Yeah, yeah. Which I like. Yes. I hate it when games it's not, just it's not one think of, those... of a trilogy later <laughs> on. Oh, this made us money. Let's yeah. make Star Wars. What a breakout success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we must make sequels to it, even though yes. it was self-contained. Yes. This was never meant to be one game. It was meant to be a trilogy from the start. Yeah. So it's it's planned out like that in these choices like this. And that's I think pretty that cool. that's pretty that's cool. That's pretty cool. So, yeah. Yeah, so, well, did you, well, I guess you played it a couple different ways, but yeah. you, I let the thing go, and then the council yeah. was super upset. Uh, but you justify it, and... Um, they seem to be okay with it, and you're yeah. allowed to keep going. It's like that's what specters do. You gotta. Yeah. We appointed you because yes. we trust your judgment. Right. So we can be as pissed as we want, but like this, that's you're you're a double O agent, basically. You <laughs> get to make your own decisions, right? And then on uh, um at, in the Normandy, you just kind of get to go around and talk to everybody again for round two. 
and it's super fun. Um, you get to talk, you get to learn a lot about Tali mm -hmm. and her like flotilla, because she's saying she can't sleep when it's quiet. Yeah. Like wherever she lives, she can't sleep. If it's quiet, that means something on the ship broke. And so yeah. Yeah, you got to get up and fix get it because yep. get it to start whirring and making sound. And um, she's used to being around a lot of people, right? Yep. And it feels really lonely and kind of empty where she is. Yeah, this is one of my favorite aspects of Mass Effect is after the missions are over, mm. going and talking to all your squad mates about it. Yeah. And again... This game does not do it nearly as well as Mass Effect 2 does. That's so funny. Yeah, I think it does it plenty well. But I think it does personally. it pretty well here. Yeah. I enjoy going and talking to all the squad yeah. members and getting their feelings on how the missions have gone and yeah. their you know concerns about the future and personal stories and, and all of that. And so I, I really like doing that. And that, you can spend a whole half hour or an hour just... Going around your ship talking to your people. Yeah, and just go and through all the questions. About them, I right? can't believe, this is one of the things about this game, I just can't believe how many minor characters you're allowed to ask uh, personal questions yeah. to. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable. Throughout all of these missions, you just keep going in and just like, well, tell me about yourself. Why, what are you doing here? And yeah. most games only allow that of key characters, and this game allows it for like, like well over 100 characters probably throughout the whole game. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's crazy. And so I really enjoy doing that and kind of digging into into the characters. And so this kind of brings me around to something we touched about on the last episode a little bit. But there's some more um, comments from uh, people on the first episode that I kind of want to circle back to. So we'll be reiterating some points, but okay. the, some of the, you know, um, the criticisms of the characters being bland or boring or whatever it is. Right. And, and I had talked about it. I, I concede that specifically for the two human squad mates. I think Ashley sure. and Caden, in particular, are not that interesting. They're the least characters. interesting by far. So, by and far. I, I would say Caden even more so than Ashley. Yes, Caden for sure. Caden, I just because... don't give a fetch about. Exactly. Him. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> um, I have never cared about him, and I, I even tried on this playthrough to ask a lot of personal yeah. questions and learn. And it's not like he has yeah. a boring past. No. There's just something about the guy talking, and it's just like. You're just a boring yeah. dude to listen to. You could go talk to all sorts of people instead of him. <laughs> all sorts of aliens and yeah. different. And it's like, you, talk, you spend your time talking so, to a dude. So there's like a whole program where they were trying to create biotics. Yeah, And yeah. this all has to do with stuff we won't get into today, but element zero. And this has to do with like a lot of the, the dark energy science fiction concepts of how the technology in Mass Effect works and the magic, the biotic powers work. Right. They harness dark energy. And so they're doing research into this and there's a lot of kids that were part of programs where they were experimented on and well, they, a lot of them died. Yeah, and they would claim that well, a lot of these people, and it was true initially, yeah. a lot of people were accidentally infected by yes. this thing. And okay, we study the ones that were accidentally infected, but a lot of them... They didn't have very many. He those. suspects he that they're not that they, all accidental. They purposefully started kind of. They messing purposefully, with people. accidentally yes. spread this. And then, oh, and we got to oh, study, study you now. Yep, yep, yep. So that's what happened to him. And, uh, anyways, he's made peace with his past release. He claims he has. Mm. But I never use him. I never bring him mm. ever. <laughs> he's I never so talk boring. to him. I just it's don't not his think. Fault. I just don't think he's an interesting character. And Ashley, yeah. I feel that way about a little bit too. But she's more interesting than him. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, In part because she's a girl, or the romance element. That element, know. but like, also her prejudice against aliens. Okay, sure. And uh, her belief in God, and just some parts right. of it that are like, you at least Very have unique. a little bit more of a personality than Caden does. But the alien crew members are freaking awesome. I yes. love talking to Rex. I love talking to Garrus, and sort of like, uh, doing the little philosophical battles about yeah. red tape and what and reg, how much regulation yes, with police officers yeah, should that's have fascinating. versus like it's just getting in the way of getting the job done. Which is so funny because we're like opposites. Garrus was yes. CSEC, and so, but he's like, eh, screw all the rules. And then we're a, a specter, but we're like, no, the rules are important. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like we're, we're, we're arguing reason... <laughs> what we would have otherwise been on yeah. opposite sides, you know? The whole reason he leaves CSEC to join a specter 
is so yes. that he won't be bogged down by the regulation yes. red tape. But if you're a Paragon Spectre, it's yeah. like, no, the laws exist for a reason. <laughs> I'm a like, lawful it, good character. Why did I get stuck with a Paragon Spectre? Yeah, or you could be a Renegade Spectre and you'll I agree on all kinds of things. Yes, of course. But they, they do a little sparring on some of those you know, ideas. I, yeah. I like those conversations. That I think Me that too. they're intellectually stimulating. Tali's fascinating. I, I love just the whole like Corian predicament that they're in. And yeah, oh yeah. The fact that they created the Geth that's and that's what made AI research um, illegal after that because the Geth are a perfect example of what happens yeah. if you mess with AI too much. Oh, this, this reminds me. There's this scene, this part in the, um, in the lab, right? Um, what is it, something 15? Peak 15. Peak 15. Uh, when you're talking with the, the AI, well, the VI interface, yes. the woman, and she's asking for a password, and you have the option to mumble something, is what it says in, uh, in brackets. It says <laughs> mumble something. And it was down to the right. It was like a renegade thing, but I was like, yeah, let's try it. That looks too fun. And so if you click on it, did you do that I by didn't chance? do okay. that one, because I didn't get that far in the renegade. Okay. Paper. If you do it, <laughs> it's so great. He goes, um, he goes, Oh, Alpha Bravo. <laughs> and he, he just like coughs and says the funniest <laughs> little mumble thing. And then the alien, or no, the alien, the artificial intelligence is just like, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> I, like, I was thinking it might actually work. Oh, uh, yeah. But he just mumbles something. And it was so funny. You got it, you guys. If you didn't do that, you absolutely should because it is so funny. <laughs> it is so funny. It, it, awesome. later, it made me laugh out loud. Yeah. And this game hasn't like done that at up to this point, you know? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's circle back to these comments here. Okay. In regards to criticisms of the morality system and the characters, right? So Catalan here says, this isn't a criticism, he's just more making a comment. Mass Effect was the first game where I started to, oh, never mind, this is the criticism one. Catalan says, Mass Effect was the first game where I started to dislike these overt moral systems. The developers don't want people to feel like the game gave them renegade points for what they thought was a Paragon action and vice versa. Right. So every Paragon sense. option needs to be obviously good and every renegade option almost comically evil. Without That's not always the case though, as I've... Yes. I pointed out once or twice yes. at the glass I, I think it's not always the case, but, but it, it often feels is. like it is. It does. Because yeah. they've sort of gamified it with yeah. your, your, your earning points towards one yep. or the other. And so you feel, because you don't know what to expect on a first playthrough. How many Paragon points do I need in order to get these ability, this ability to persuade yes. people later or intimidate the people RPG later? The RPG element, yeah. I'm just going to go with Paragon every time just to be safe. Yeah. Whereas, like we were saying, maybe the more natural playthrough is some form of split. Where in the case where mm -hmm. you're, you're up against a bunch of enemies and Korra's den, intimidating them makes way more sense yes. than persuading them. Yes. Even if you are a Paragon. And yes. talking to your squad mates in ways that are reassuring and as a leader in, uh, motivates them makes way more sense than talking down to them all the time. Yes. Like you have to build a rapport yeah. with your team. You can't just like be a dick to everybody. Right. So some form of split seems to make more sense, but it seems like yeah. just the way they set up the wheel and the way that they gamified Paragon and Renegade mm -hmm. and earning the points led people into this conclusion that I've always yeah. got to go with this one. Yeah. And like I said, I'm just played up through Novaria. We're not even halfway through the game yet. I'm almost, I'm maxed out on charm. Right. And I have so many Paragon points that I could probably at this point never have to worry about not being able to do the Paragon option. Right. And that's very early on. So it, there's obviously leeway in the game to split you and just still have enough. That. You just don't know it on yeah. a first playthrough. Yeah. It almost feels like to do an optimal playthrough of Mass Effect <laughs> where Commander Shepard isn't clueless about the world around him uh -huh, yeah. and where he has the, the, a good balance between intimidation and persuasion, it's almost like you require a second playthrough where you have some you previous You have to knowledge. do a second playthrough. You're 75 Paragon, 25 not. <laughs> and then you ignore all of the stupid dialogue options. Just don't <laughs> click them. But you can only do those three things on a second playthrough, yeah. knowing ahead of time. Right. Otherwise, it's like you're going to miss stuff or you're going to do the wrong thing. Yeah. So anyways, um, yeah. I, I think that it's a, it's a criticism that um, is valid because the way the game is structured sort of leads you into that conclusion. But I yeah. think if you were to play it without worrying so much about getting the points, 
it would feel more natural. And it I would. think that's probably the probably way they... probably still be able to do all the that's things That's probably the, the way they intended it to be yeah. playing. They probably didn't want you to just choose Paragon every time, right? Yeah, I hope but not. they <laughs> led you into doing that, yeah, and yeah. that's maybe a failing of the design, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, there was one other... This was from David uh, Sachs. I, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's S-Z-A-K-S. Jacques? Zach, I don't Zach's. know how to pronounce that. Uh -huh. um, he says, uh, someone should tell Kaysen that there are more than enough Paragon points in the game to hit max if he feels like peppering in some Renegade choices every now and then. I think you okay. only have to hit 80-ish yeah, percent for all the bonus as well. So mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to max it out. Also, if you don't Good care to too much about cheesing the game, there's a way to manufacture infinite Paragon and Renegade points on Novaria. Well, I figure most games have a, an exploit like that. Yeah, we've already passed Novaria <laughs> at this point, so. Yeah. But if you wanted to, there's a way to cheese the game into maxing it so yeah. you don't have to worry, and then you can just do whatever you and want. And just do whatever. That's an option for people who want to do it that way. Um, okay. I think that's going to be it well, for this week. Do you have any more notes? Just one thing I really do like about the game is that sometimes when you go to certain worlds, you'll, well, if there's a mini, like, a, what would you call it? Like a mini mission? What's the word? A side, side quest, quest or something involved? Uh, you'll get a transmission for a place, but not until you kind of like look like at it. Like arrive at yeah. the system. Yeah, so yeah. you show up and then it's like, oh, psh, and you get that, but you don't get it ahead of time. And I, at first I was like, oh, that's convenient, right? Yeah. That's kind of weird. Uh, I actually like it, though. Because if you got a ton of those transmissions randomly throughout the game, you you would either end up forgetting about them, or um, they would come at a really bad time or something like that. I, I, time. The way yeah. that they do it is you go to this place, then you get the transmission while you're there, and you can just go there and do it right now. Yeah, I actually really like it. Like story-wise, it's a little iffy, but for the game, it's it's awesome. Yeah, like I think it, it's super. Cool. It, it gets it makes it so you don't miss out on stuff. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, jeez. It's convenient to help you stay on hey, track. Hey, there are millions like me. There are millions I, like me, literally. Are. Chrissy is very much like that. So. Is she? Yeah. It's part of why I like RPGs a lot. You just max out your level and do yeah. everything. Do in the game. everything, <laughs> right? Anyways, um, so for the next episode, um, we're going to try and take these two missions at a time um, rather than three. So I tried to sneak three in the Citadel, which is almost like two in and, it's of, in and of itself. There's yes. a lot going on there. But we did Liara's Dig Site and Novaria as one episode now. So next time, do Pharos, which is the last of the initial three missions, and then do Vermeer, and then um, stop there. So we'll just cover Pharos and Vermeer in the next episode, which would be episode four. Sweet. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this week. Thank you for watching, everybody. We hope you have a great holiday season. I believe today is the when this goes live, the 22nd. 22. Yeah, so Merry Christmas to those celebrating Christmas and happy holidays to everybody else celebrating other stuff. Uh, what are you guys doing? For uh, well, happy Wednesday if you happy don't Wednesday celebrate if you don't any celebrate holidays any of it. <laughs> either. Happy um, Wednesday. Um, I don't know that we're going to be doing much. Um, are you just staying home, just you and your family? Or are you some families coming over and yeah. Parker should be in town. Oh, will he be in town? Um, yeah. Did he come for Thanksgiving? He did didn't not. this year. He did. He was with his yeah. wife's family. Yeah. So he's instead he's coming this nice. this time. So that'll be fun. That's yeah. Awesome. So I'll just be chilling with family. Nice. Same. Uh, we went to Denver for Thanksgiving, so I'll be here for Christmas. Um. Yeah. Anyways, have a good one, everybody. We'll see you next week. Peace out. Peace.